I'm Mark. And I'm Alyssa. Welcome. And we're here to share our experiences with, uh, with you about expanding open source in Africa. So at its, at its heart, what's the problem we're discussing today? And the problem is best summarized by two numbers. 16. So over 16% of the world's population lives in Africa. That's one out of six inhabitants live in Africa. But two, that other number, is the percentage of GitHub active users that are coming from the African continent. So it's more like one in 40 active users on GitHub that are coming from the African continent. So Africa is underrepresented in the open source. We know that there is currently 1.4 billion people living in Africa. So that number is comparable in size to India. The Indian subcontinent is about 1.4 billion population as well. Um, so what this means is that there is potential for Africa to be a big time contributor, much like India. From the, from the data, the open source world needs Africa's contribution. What you see here on the graph is that on the topmost bar, North America has about one third of GitHub active users. Um, Asia has another roughly one third, and at slightly less than one third, Europe. And now if we go continue down the chart, second from the bottom, Africa at 2.3%. So there's a long way to go for African contributors per capita to be anywhere near at parity with North America, Asia, or Europe. We've got lots to do to reach out to people in Africa who can help with open source. Now Africa really is a great place to do open source. It's a developing, it's a series of developing economies. The economies are growing there. We see lots of technic technological growth in places like Kenya and Nigeria. Lots and lots of strong, strong technology in South Africa. Uh, we see increasing education happening amongst the people who are in Africa. Uh, and software skills are matching to that education. We're delighted to see it. It's good to see that kind of growth along with improving network access as their access to the internet continues to steadily improve. So what's being done? So Google Summer of Code has started 17 years ago. It's a worldwide program. It's a three-month internship where it offers internships to college students to work in the open source. It has over 18,000 students um, participated in the program. Over 700 mentoring organization, aka open source organizations that supported and participated in this program, with over 17 members, mentors, excuse me, with over 17,000 mentors involved in the program. It is a three month funded internship where Google pays both the mentoring organization as well as the intern. Now Google Summer of Code is a, is a little bit complicated for African contributors because it's a worldwide program, which means as they apply to Google Summer of Code, they are competing with top contributors from universities in India, top contributors from universities in the United States and in Europe. And so it's, it's more challenging to get into Google Summer of Code because of its nature as a worldwide program. Google Season of Docs has a slightly different focus. Google Season of Docs is attempting to bring skilled technical writers to open source projects to contribute to the open source project's documentation. Whereas Google Summer of Code is really looking at how do we help brand new contributors arrive, what Google Season of Docs is doing is saying let's take skilled technical writers and have them help these projects. We've used Google Season of Docs as well, but it's a different focus than Google Summer of Code. So Outreachy, what is Outreachy? It's a worldwide internship um, where it focuses on open source and open science. 
It provides internship to people that are subject to systematic bias and impacted by the underrepresentation in the technical industry where they are living. Interns receive $7,000 stipend for a three-month internship where they work remotely one-on-one -on -one with a mentor. So historically, um, Outreachy has been around for a while. They've been in operation for 12 years. They have served over 1,000 interns, and their internship completion rate is quite high. 19 out of 20 of those interns successfully complete the program. Now, the success is due um, also due, uh, in, in part due to the collaboration of mentors, coordinators, sponsors, and projects. And all these combined helps to make the program successful, and it has been quite successful. She Code Africa, now where Outreachy, Google Season of Docs, and Google Summer of Code are all three worldwide programs, She Code Africa is a different program in the sense that it is intentionally and specifically focused on Africa. Uh, what happens in She Code Africa is we do a once a year contribute-thon as an open source boot camp that focuses on involving women from Africa in open source. Uh, it's a one month project. Each of the women that's selected for this project receives a $500 US stipend paid to them in country where they are. In every one of these cases, the components look the same. We need sponsors, right, in any one of these programs. There's funds that need to be, need to be provided in order to sponsor the organization. We need open source organizations, projects, that open source organizations that are willing to host the effort. Uh, we need projects within those open source organizations that are willing to do the work. And mentors or skilled train trainers that are willing to coach these new contributors as they come onto the project to become contributors. So remember that sponsors, projects, mentors, and organizations are crucial for the success of these. Without any one of those four, it just won't work. Now, how does this effort help open source projects? So I'm going to put on my, take my hat off of lobbying for why we should be helping Africa more and talk about how the Jenkins project, in my specific case, is benefited by our interactions with women contributors and other contributors from Africa. So the challenge here is what benefit does Jenkins receive because it's involved in these outreach programs? We've seen strong contributions to Jenkins Core and to Jenkins plugins because we've received more contributors from these outreach programs and they've solved truly valuable problems for us. Uh, we're also delighted that we've learned better how to do group mentoring. We've come to understand that there are certain things that will help and other things that are less helpful as we work with these new contributors. We've discovered problems in our onboarding process, in our what does it take to become a developer process. All those things, thanks to being involved in these kind of outreach activities. So the Jenkins project has participated in two contributions, six Google Summer of Code, and one Outreachy. We've mentored um, over 45 new contributors to date. Now what this means, as Mark has mentioned earlier, there's been improvements and additions to our documentation, to our API, to our plugins, to our core, and so on. And also, Mark also mentioned that there were lessons that we learned and, and, and things that this, these programs has taught us. And also that these programs also came with some challenges as well, and Mark will talk us through that in later slides. Now, one of the incentives for Jenkins as a project and for other open source projects is the real contributions. Let's look at some specific examples here. Uh, Jenkins users want to manage their systems with configuration as code. They want to track in a repository the exact configuration. That thing listed there called the plugin installation manager is critical to that activity. Let's me track Jenkins plugin versions precisely. That's a Google Summer of Code project from multiple years ago provided by a student. It's now used in tens of thousands 
of Jenkins installations. That student's work lives on and is still actively maintained. Likewise, many of us are GitHub users. We want to have a strong connection between Jenkins and the GitHub web interface so that when I look at the GitHub page, I can see the results of my Jenkins job. The GitHub checks API from a Google Summer of Code project is the thing that does that. Again, we've had students, first, first time contributors, doing this work in ways that has helped specifically large numbers of Jenkins users. We see the same thing with the GitLab branch source. It's a, a project that allows us to do multi-branch Jenkins pipelines with GitLab, thanks to, again, a student contributor doing that work. So we're very grateful for the results of these outreach programs and glad to see how they succeed. Now, how does it work? What actually happens in the project as we do these things? What we see is that we start in the top left here with organizers. These are, for example, the people at Google who run Google Summer of Code or the, the women who run She Code Africa Contributeathon. As organizers, they start, start the whole process proposing an outreach program. This outreach program that they propose needs funding and they don't have funding initially. It needs projects, it needs people to mentor, and it needs contributors who are willing to be mentored. That's the beginning. The organizers then go looking for sponsors. This is commonly companies or foundations who are willing to put cash out to provide, to allow the contributors to be paid. It's crucial in this environment that these brand new contributors must be paid. We cannot rely on them donating their time when they're fresh in their career, expecting that they'll, oh, just give it away for free so that we mentor them. The crucial nature of the funding from sponsors arriving all the way to the contributors is part of what makes these programs a success. Now that third piece there, the mentors, without it, none of the rest of the pieces are relevant. We have to have skilled mentors from inside the project to coach these people. Otherwise, they are left floundering, not knowing what to do or how to do it. So remember those four items, organizers, sponsors, mentors, and contributors. So Google Summer of Code this year has four projects, and came with that was for um, college-age students that are driving the efforts and working within these four projects. We currently have 10 mentors for four of these students, and five out of those 10 are, curr are currently alumni. They're formerly GSOC students that came back and wanted to give, pay it forward and um, become a mentor. So five of those mentors are former GSOC students, and five mentors are longtime contributors in the Jenkins project. Now this is the best we've seen to date of return rate for previously successful students coming back to act as mentors. It'd been more typical we'd get one or two. This year we're really pleased that half the mentors were previously students who had done a successful project. So Outreachy, um, the Jenkins project has been involved in one Outreachy project. We had two students, one mentor for those two students, their internship was worth three months of work, and they worked on audit login plugin for Jenkins. The She Code Africa Contributeathon we've done for two years. This year, we took on three projects, each with two contributors on that project. Um, so it gives us six contributors with four mentors. These these new contributors to Jenkins spent a month working on things that the Jenkins project needed. They were paid $500 at the end of their successful completion. We were really pleased with it. Let's talk about who these people are because it helps you see a little bit knowing who they are. In the top left, that's Afi. She's from Ghana. Top right, Catherine from Kenya. Middle right, Peace Okafor. So Afi is a Java developer. Catherine's a documentation person. Peace, on the center right, is a front-end developer. Uh, Nafisa, in the bottom left, was our project manager. So SheCode Africa provided us a project manager, 
and contributors to help support it. And each of them received that, that stipend to make sure that they were funded for their month of work. Uh, Soma and Sophia, the two at the bottom, are both front-end developers, if I remember correctly, and did excellent work for us in a one-month time that we worked together with them. Good, good connections and good contributions. Now, our mentors, there were four of us, one from France, uh, one from the Boston area, one from North Carolina, and me from Colorado. And we dealt with time zones. We dealt with complications related to networks. We guided and tutored these new contributors. We had to teach them some things, right? Many of them, GitHub was a little bit surprising for them. They hadn't dealt with it, and they had certainly never contributed to an open source pro project. We had to be the ones who evaluated their results, who coached them on how to investigate problems in their configuration or to review their changes. Uh, all things that helped them and helped our project. And the four sponsors for uh, this program were CD Foundation, The At Company, CloudBees, and Deploy Hub. They provided the cash to keep the fund for the to, to keep the funds for these efforts. So basically the funds were used to pay the contributors for, for their stipend and also support the organizers. And in addition to sponsors, of course, Mark mentioned that we need a place for these folks to work and that work is in the open source. So this, this year's uh, projects were Jenkins, Layer 5, and Deploy Hub. They brought people in to propose ideas. They, brought, they work on the ideas, the contributors work on the ideas, and then um, the project would provide mentors. So the mentors then in turn provides their expertise, their guidance, feedback, and evaluations. So we wanted to share with you that it's not all, all roses and happiness in terms of dealing with these kinds of outreach projects. There are plenty of challenges, plenty of comp compromises and complications that we have to handle. For the contributors, so this is their first experience typically with an open source project. They've never done this kind of remote thing before. They may be fresh out of the university or still in a university. That experience alone says, oh, they were accustomed to a classroom environment where the people are experts telling them what to do they arrive on an open source project where they're expected to be much more self-powered, self self-motivated, and ready to ask questions. So part of the challenge is we have to be sure we're coaching them on how to communicate, uh, how to encourage them to ask questions. Addition to that, time zone can be really challenging. Those of us who are on the U.S. West Coast, it's a long way to Ghana. It's multiple time zones to reach out to Ghana. Uh, likewise to Nigeria. The communication channels to these African countries are oftentimes not as reliable as those of us who are in the United States are accustomed to dealing with, right? North American networks, we've been working internet for a long time and they are just reliable. In Africa, not, not necessarily. Many times these project participants dial in from their cell phone. They join a Zoom call from their cell phone because that's what's working. Or other times we have to switch to use Google Meet instead of Zoom because for whatever reason in that particular day, Meet was working better than Zoom. Adapting to communication problems is just part of the challenge. The other is that they're on a short time scale and they're trying to accelerate their learning. So for them, it's daunting. They have to learn a lot very, very fast. Now the mentors have, a, have those challenges, plus they've got to learn to adapt to coaching people with widely varying levels of skills. We had documentation writers, we had front-end developers with no Java experience, we had back-end developers with hardly any JavaScript experience. And in each case, some specific coaching was needed to help them reach their best potential in the time that we had. For the organizers, okay, this one, my heart goes out to the organizers. So uh, my friend Zinab is one of the organizers. She's from Nigeria. And 
her challenge is to find open source projects that are willing to, to participate with her and find sponsors who will pay funds to allow them to run the operation. And then they have to do all the processing work. How do they distribute the funds out to the participants across all the African nations that they're serving? All sorts of things that I'm grateful as an open source project not to have to do. I have no idea how I would pay someone funds in Nigeria that we would like to get to them. I just don't know how to do it, but Chicote Africa, Outreachy, Google Summer of Code, and Google Season of Docs all know how to do that. Now as a project, what we've found as the Jenkins project is one of the most daunting things is finding mentors. It's a pretty common behavior that open source project participants participate because they're interested in something that benefits them. It's a good thing. Guided self-interest is really helpful. However, that does not naturally lead them to be mentors. So we have to sort of beg, cajole, sometimes plead, could you come help us mentor in addition to your already existing passion for the thing that you're doing? Mentoring is complicated. It's not a natural thing for most developers to, to find a way to mentor. The other challenge is we've got to find good projects that fit within the time scale and the skill level of these new contributors. Project definition can be challenging as well. How do you find something that you can do successfully in a month on an open source project and is useful? So let's talk about the results that we've gained from this. So, so for Google Summer of Code, um, the results we received were plugin installation improvements, GitHub performance improvements, GitHub checks were added, multi-branch GitLab pipelines were supported. Google Season of Docs wrote the Jenkins installation documentation for Kubernetes. Xenop was actually our, our, our writer for that. And she taught us all sorts of interesting things about how non-portable our documentation build system was. We thought we'd created a portable documentation system and she proved conclusively that we had not. All the dockerization we did, all of the things we thought were making it so portable, ultimately surprised us when she tried to build on Windows. She is still involved in the project. So we're, we're delighted with that project, that process, but it educated us about, it removed one of our points of kidding ourselves, our points of delusion, right? Where we say, we thought we had a portable documentation system, it turns out it wasn't as portable as we thought. So SheCode Africa Contributhon receives over 400 plus applications from women from 10 different African countries. The sad thing is that only one out of 10 of those applications are accepted. And this is due to the lack of sponsors, due to the lack of projects and mentors. However, for the folks that were, are in the program, 97% of them are happily satisfied with the program. 87% of the mentees do successfully complete the program. For Outreachy, 80% um, of the alumni continues to contribute to the open source. 44 of them uh, that are employed continues to contribute to the open source as part of their job. Now because Outreachy supports STEM, 22% of past interns are STEM students, and 61% of those interns have found jobs in large enterprises like Intel, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, so on. So, what's next? The what's next? Ask your company to sponsor. We mentioned earlier that cash donation is crucial. It helps fund these programs and it helps to keep the lights on for these folks. Um, and if you have you know, DNI programs in your company, be a part of that. Ask them to join your company. Give them a platform so then they can speak to bring awareness and visibility. Um, and then donation wise, what I typically do is always include the sponsorship as part of my um, budget planning the year before. So I can always make sure that I, they, we cover them in terms of sponsorship in the next year. 
So this one is, for me, was a quite instructive experience. How do I ask my employer to get really involved in putting cash into funding one of these outreach programs? And finding it is specific to that employer. Some organizations do their donations through an entirely independent foundation. Others have an organization that's dedicated to diversity, and you need to get on their queue. Finding who it is in your company and how you ask the question is already an important and valuable step. Once you've found that, then there's the piece of now you've got to lobby to them why this organization is better than that organization, and they'll make their trade-offs and compromises. So ask your company to sponsor, help them make diversity and inclusion real. Um, all too often we get organizations that talk an awful lot about diversity and inclusion, and this is a chance to put cash into a diversity initiative. Now, the other part of this is cash funding is great, but we need projects, we need ideas on which people can work. And so my suggestion here is propose ideas to your favorite open source project. Now mine is Jenkins, therefore I put the Jenkins logo. You pick your favorite project, whatever that is, suggest to them small projects that could be done by new contributors supported by mentors. Test automation is a good one. Ask yourself, does my open source project have enough tests? Uh, most of the projects I've seen, the answer is no. I know that the answer is no with Jenkins. Absolutely, we, we do not have nearly enough automated tests. It's a great task for a new contributor. Help them learn how to write tests, help us get the benefit of their having written tests. Likewise, online help, documentation, uh, specific small features are good fits for these kinds of projects. Next, be a mentor. Offer your time and your skill in your project to coach someone else. I admit it, it's not the same as writing code. You're trying to help somebody else as they write code. And if your love is pure and simple code writing, this may not be the choice for you. But boy, we need mentors. Yes, indeed, we do. And that covers the talk that we had for today. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask before we close? So, so we're actually continuing with all four. So we will continue to use, let's bring them up here. So we'll continue to use Google Summer of Code. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This one is very active, but it's worldwide. Okay. All right. We did one Google Season of Docs. We probably won't do a second Google Season of Docs because the engagement level they expect for Google Season of Docs does not fit real well with the Jenkins project. Others may, but for us it was they're expecting a higher engagement level than we're ready to commit right now. Outreachy, we, we will likely re-engage with them in the future, and She Code Africa, yes, absolutely. We did it last year, we'll do, we've done it again this year, we expect to do it again next year. Good, good question. So the question was, is there anything on the Jenkins site that guides these sorts of efforts? And there are. So what you'll see on the Jenkins website, Jenkins.io, is, is a segment on outreach. And in that segment on outreach, there are each of these four is actually identified as a project. And under each of them, there are typically things that are f new, new contributor-friendly issues that they're encouraged to assist with as a way to get started. And that those, again, that's another place where a, a contribution is needed. It's difficult to identify which issues are well suited to new contributors. You need to be aware of the project well enough that you can say, ah, oh, that's an easy one. Oh no, that's a hard one.
Egg, egg, good point. So you note that in the FreeBSD project and in many, there are tags or labels that are applied to bugs to say that this is a candidate for an, an early contributor, and, and we have those exactly. And that's so you query our, our bug tracker, and you see, oh, here are the, the first-time contributor-friendly issues. Absolutely, and, and we like that. That's a good way for them to find and find something interesting to them and work on the thing that's interesting to them. Right, right. So good point is that it's much cheaper I or it's, it's healthier for the project if we identify good first issues as we're creating the issues or triaging them. Yes, very good. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, uh, what sort of requirements are there to be like an open source project that uh, participates in stuff like that? Like, do you have to be like really large and widely used? Or, uh, good question. So is there a size requirement, or, or what are the requirements or expectations of projects that participate? Is, did I state your question correctly? So if we look at SheCode Africa, their project sizes are, several of them are actually quite small. So the Layer 5 project and Deploy Hub are actually relatively smaller projects, uh, not, not enormous. There is certainly nothing on the scale of the Jenkins project or the FreeBSD project or any of the Linux distributions. And, and you can work well with them so long as you're willing to dedicate someone to, to help them. Now. Others, for instance, I would not embark on Google Summer of Code unless I had, well, in the Jenkins organization, we had three organization admins running this year to support mm -hmm. these four projects. And the work is substantial because it's very competitive. What's happening is we're taking cash from Google, effectively, and paying contributors to work on Jenkins. And other projects have exactly the same desire. They want Google's cash to help pay contributors to their project. So it's more challenging to, to do an effective Google Summer of Code project than it is to do SheCode Africa contribute on, for example. Right. right. Google. Yeah, so uh, Alyssa is one of our org, org admins. I should be quiet and let you speak up on this one, Alyssa. Uh, well, so for Google Summer of Code, you d as a mentoring organization, you do have to apply, just like the student themselves has to go through an application process. So we do the same thing. We have a form that we fill out, questions, questionnaires that we need to fill out, and then um, they choose. They go away for a couple of weeks, and then they come back and they make their announcement. I don't know how they choose their mentoring organizations. But I have seen there are organizations where um, it was they weren't accepted. But we've been fortunate enough that we've been in the program for six years now, so um, that kind of buys some uh, kudos for yeah, been there. Right, and, and it's. So did that address your question? And I think if I can also add, um, the other thing that's really helpful is, w is, is that there's a lot of prep work that needs to be done by the project prior to the application for the mentoring organization. And I think Google looks into all of that as well. You know, are your web pages uh, up to date with regards to your proposal ideas? Um, where your, your communication channels, how are you prepping students, um, potential students, right? So they look holistically at all that, and they just want to make sure that, and we do too, that when we get into this program, that we are successful as well as the students. Yes. So your question is, have we considered send, sending someone physically into Africa to act as a mentor rather than 
being in time zone here locally. I have not in part because we've found it so difficult to locate effective mentors already. I can't imagine telling them, yes, you'll need to relocate to Africa for a month. Uh, my, my company would not fund me, for example. They, they happily fund me mentoring for a month because it's two to four hours a week. If I instead said, oh, I need, to, I need to fly into Africa, have accommodations there that are safe, reliable, et cetera, they would not know how to do it because at least my company does not, not actively sell into these portions of Africa, and therefore we have no business relationship with anyone in, in these pieces of Africa right now. I am certainly open to that. Let's let's connect by email and have the conversation. Be Let's look at the let's look at the map here to get a hint of what Shikot Africa has done in terms of their their country coverage. So they've accepted applications from ten African nations, both West Africa and and Southern Africa and into the the Central East, right? So so able to accept applications and provide funding for women in these, okay, the darker color there is the ones I believe where they've actually had contributors accepted and paid funds out there. Right. The others are where they had applicants and did not accept anyone into, that, into the program at that point. But they're ready to pay out in those locations when they haven't accepted. And they're open to other potential... My, are they open to other potential countries? Yes, as far as I understand it, they are. Now they've they've certainly shared with me that the banking challenges are real. Transferring funds from one country to another a in Africa is every bit as complicated as transferring funds from one country to another here. So, so international transfers are, are complicated, right. but that's part of what they provide as an organizer. Good. Any other questions? So, so may I, are you okay if I restate your question for the recording? I think what you're asking is, sh are there steps that open source projects should take to better adapt to people in Africa who may have specific challenges with internet connectivity or with internet bandwidth? Did, is that a fair way to say it? Yeah. And, and I, I think there are, and I think one of the hints, there, there are two or three. One is that we discovered, yes, we did have some high expectations for bandwidth because you run Maven, Maven compile and it downloads the, downloads the internet in order to populate its cache. And, and that was, okay, we're not sure how to fix that one. Then, then the next learning phase was, oh, and now we've got a build system that requires Docker images and they're nice and portable in that sense, but now you're gonna download the hundreds of megabytes of Docker images 
And so we had to forewarn these participants, start this download, and it, we, we, could, we had to stop assuming that during our meetings they could download an artifact and have it ready. Right. It, was, it was a flawed assumption on my, because of course I'm spoiled, right? Here in the US, it, in North America, I, I want it and it's already on my desktop. And for them it was, oh, you want that 90 megabyte Jenkins war file that has all its dependencies in it, 90 megabytes coming into the country is going to take a while. Right, exactly. And so, so that was a piece. Now the other piece is one that we're still evolving, and that's to have pre-configured development environments that are available and hosted remotely for them. In our case, we've been using Gitpod as a facility that allows us to define with a little bit of YAML what the IDE and development environment for that thing is. They press one button and it says open in Gitpod and what it does is spawn, uh, spins up a machine on Gitpod servers and they've got a running, running IDE, in this case running Visual Studio Code, and they can do development right there without having downloaded anything except the interaction between the web page and them. So yeah, good question. Any, any other questions? So how much of what they, what they code is relevant to them in country? Is that what you're asking? Right. So, so what we found, and again, this is specific to the Jenkins project, but what we found was most of them had no experience with an automation server whatsoever, so no experience with continuous integration. The concept was completely foreign to them. We were introducing them to a brand new concept. Here's this Jenkins controller this Jenkins controller lets you automate things. This process, the month that we spent together with them on, on the project, educated them to a facility they didn't know existed. And that was beneficial to them, right? They will take that into their employment now. They'll take that into their university work. Did it, did it match with any specific in-country needs they had? I didn't ever detect that. All I saw was that I'm a firm believer that they will benefit professionally by knowing that there is such a thing as continuous integration and that as they use it, they will be better for their employer and better for their own career growth. Right. We certainly did, for instance, with She Code Africa, we did host sessions where we gave tutorials. And so I did a tutorial, this is how you use Git, and how we use GitHub on the project. And I was astonished at the number of these women who said, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. I thought I was saying things that everybody knew, and I was telling them something that of course they'd already previously experienced, and their answer was no, they had not experienced it. It was brand new to them, and they were happy to have someone introduce them to the concept of a pull request, the concept of an issue on GitHub, and how you interact with other people. So, so very positive. Did that answer your question? Yes, Any other questions? All right, well, Thank you very much. Thanks for being at Scale 19X. Thanks again. Have a great trip home. We'll see you.